Ooh, how many guys like to be a superhero? Raise your hand. You ever wanted to be a superhero? I, I wanted to be, anybody wanted to be like a super strong like superhero, like be able to whoop people's butt? Brian wanted to, was that a set? Did you just stand up? Oh, Superman, there he is. <laughs> Wanna be. Okay, um, how many of you guys ever wanted to be like a Spider-Man, be able to like climb up walls and do all these things? Um, I wanted to be, when I was growing up, I wanted to be Mr. Invisible. Wouldn't it be awesome to all of a sudden just surprise your mom and dad? No, that's probably not a good idea. Just, I mean, just to appear somewhere and, and be able to whoop some tell with people who are, who are doing bad things. And they just jump up and there's all surprise that there's this guy dressed in a, what color suit? Purple. Let's say, I'm in a purple suit and I just appear there and I beat people up. All for the name of Jesus, of course. Um, but being invisible would be would be great, wouldn't it? That's my fantasy. That kind of like deflated, so that's that's not good. But I think inside of each and every one of us, we have desired, and we want to be special. We want God to say, you know what? I, I'm going to use you in in some special, incredible, supernatural way. Would you agree that you would like God to do that to you? Use me, God, in something great. Use me in a way that makes a difference. Not just a difference, I'll make a good job and give a tithe to the church and live a life. No, do something great for God. Wouldn't that be awesome? All right. And today we're going to be starting this story through Elijah and this normal guy that God calls out. But before... If you know the story about Elijah, later on, um, he, in like chapter three, like second chapter, we'll be talking about, he, he was able to call out fire from heaven and he annihilate this and then literally kill a whole bunch of people because people started to disobey God. And, and I think that that before he could even be calling out fire from heaven, he had to go through the Kareef ravine. So if you would, turn your Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 17 first kings chapter 17 we're just going to jump right into this story it's a longer story and and we're going to just jump right into it and try to make um some sense of this sound good i wanted to excuse the lights that we have up here it's kind of weird the fire marshal came by and just said that we need to figure out a couple more things of the light so i'm going to try to stay here that's not going to happen so first kings chapter 17 you ready for this All right, here we go. Before we go into this chapter 17 portion, we have to understand the background about what's going on. The background is this. Who is the first king of Israel? Who's the first king of Israel? Saul. Saul, okay. Who is the second king of Israel? David. David. Who is the third king of Israel? Solomon. Who is the fourth king of Israel? Nobody necessarily knows. Unless you look in the Bible. Because what happened is this. We've got Saul. We've got David. We've got Solomon. We, we hear about these guys. Then all of a sudden when Solomon dies, Israel gets split into two. It gets split into Judah and it gets split into Israel. Two nations, two kingdoms. And all of a sudden a king from both try to reign and try to do their thing. But one nation did God's work. Some of the kings screwed up. But then there was this other part of Israel that started to screw up really, really, really bad. They said, I don't give a rip about God. I want to do what the world wants me to do. And I'm going to do what I want to do because I am king. So I'm going to do what I want to do. And what ended up happening in Israel, there ended up being, night before the story, roughly about 19 kings before this king. And all 19 were bad, sinful, terrible, terrible kings. Not even one good one. 19 consecutive bad kings along the way. And then we get to this guy named Ahab that we're going to talk about in a second. Not only that, is that he started to worship Baal, which is, is basically the really bad God, little g God. He was a fake God, just an, a God that just didn't make sense to worship. Because this bell god didn't do anything because he was not a real god. But they decided to worship him just because everyone else was. Not only did Ahab start to worship the anti-god, 
he started to, he, he married Jezebel. You've heard of Jezebel? Let's just say Jezebel was kind of like the priestess of Baal. And, and let me give you a picture of how Baal worship worked. The way it works is this. If you wanted to um, have Baal take care of your issues, you would come into the temple courts. And into these temple courts, there were prostitutes within the temple courts. You would just do your thing, literally, if you're married or not, you would do, have sex, relations, with the, with the priestess, with the, with the prostitute, male or female. And then, that is your act of worship to Baal. Um, and, and, and with that aspect, you are becoming one with Baal. Because these are the temple prostitutes. Kind of interesting. Imagine coming up here and say, yeah, this next room, if you want to encounter God, go over here and do your thing with Him. Come back and your sins are forgiven. Wouldn't that be interesting? I don't know about you, but that would be weird. That would just be weird. All right. What? Oh, they're coming back in. What did you just do? Uh, no. Uh, uh, okay. All right. So Jezebel was the highest ranking um, prostitute um, worshiper of that time. So that, that's the situation. So Israel had just turned into this God-fearing nation with a man after God's own heart and Solomon who built the temple and so on and so forth. And then 19 consecutive bad times, which equaled out to be about 200 years before after Solomon had died. And this is the story. So sometimes the Bible, it gives you snippets of kings and snippets of stories. And in this case, um, kings started out as this umbrella, kind of like we're talking about in men's Bible study, uh, an umbrella picture of, of what's going on. And all of a sudden, it takes a break in 1 Kings 17. And it says, here's the umbrella. We're looking at all this. Now let's zero in on this story that makes a radical change within this nation. Does that make sense so far? All right, so 1 Kings chapter 17. I'm always going to look at verse 1 real quick. Now, who? Elijah. Elijah a Tibite from Tishbe um, in uh, Gilead said to who? Ahab. Who is Ahab? The king. This is the worst of the worst king. According to the Bible, if you look right back in 16, it says this, that Ahab was the worst of the worst of the worst of the worst Kings out of all the 19 kings. So this guy really made God upset. And I don't know about you, but what if I was God, I would send a nuclear bomb. I would send like a tidal wave. I would send like an earthquake, fire from heaven, which that's coming. But I, I would get after this city in some major ways. I would assassinate Ahab and I would kill Jezebel and, and I would do it in a very public way. But that's just me. But God does, didn't do that in this case. What God did is he sent Elijah. Not fire from heaven. Not a flood. Not an earthquake. He sent who? Elijah. And I'm going to pause and say this. I think many times in our lives we are sent. And we think, you know what, God, you could have sent somebody better. You could have done better than me. You could have done better than you. But God sent you to be the ambassador, as we talked about last week. You, God sent you as the ambassador of Christ to your workplace, to your family. He did not do a catastrophic event. He is sending who? Elijah. He's sending us into his workplace. All right, here we go. So he said this. He, Elijah is talking to who? King who? Ahab. Ever say King Ahab? All right. And it says this, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, whom I, what? Whom I serve. In other words, it's like, you serve Baal, I serve God, let's find out who the true God is. So you serve God, the little g God, I serve the God of Israel, the God in 200 years ago, the God of Sol Solomon, the God of David, the God of Saul, the God who took us out of Egypt, I serve that God, and because I serve this God, this is the message that God has for you. There will neither be dew nor rain in the next few, how, how long? Next few what? Years. years. Not just a couple days, but the next few years, except by what? By whose word? Not specifically God, but who? 
Elijah. Imagine this, having the power. Just, just picture that. Sometimes, I mean, we're reading these stories and we're like, man, that's just a cool story. But just picture that. God chose you, say you were Elijah, to walk into the worst king ever. Here's Jezebel probably like doing her thing over there with some other guy. And, and all of a sudden, Elijah's coming up and saying this. Check it out. I am a servant of the Most High God. I am telling you there's not going to be any more rain whatsoever unless I say so. What would you have done if you were Elijah or if you were Ahab? I'd kill him and say, shut up, yeah, right. We've got Baal, that's all we need, cut off his head and die. We're going to find out how Elijah quickly ran away. We're going to get to that. But imagine that honor to be able to say, you know what? God has used me to stop the rain. To stop even the little dew in the morning to, to make a point. And we read that and we're like, there's no way God can use us to make that big of a difference. I disagree. Because God wants to use each and every one of you in some mighty ways. But most of the time we are sissies. God chose Elijah and Elijah became obedient and he became even more obedient as the story goes on. And the, the, I, I prayed this a little bit ago. And my prayer is this. And I think this is God's prayer for us. God is saying this. There is so much more. So much more. There is so much more I want to do in you. Because there's so much more I want to do. What? What does that say? Through you. Let's, let's read that together. Well, together, let's, that's all together. By the way, are you guys awake? Yes. All right, I'm medicated right now, so it's good. We're going to have some fun. <laughs> Rachel drugged me last night, but that's beside the point. Okay. <laughs> Don't take NyQuil the night before you're preaching. Okay. Let's read it together. There's so much more I want to do in you because there's so much more I want to do through you. Do you believe that? If you believe that, God could call you to President Obama and say, you know what? Here's the message from God. That's the picture here. The nation's capital, the nation's leader walking in and saying, check it out, king. Check it out, president. Check it out, senator. Check it out, whoever. Saying, God has something great and you're screwing it up. And because you're screwing it up, God is going to punish you. And in this time, you have to put this in the picture. Stop of rain doesn't seem like that big of a deal. We've had a drought recently, haven't we? Yes. All right? And, and, it's, and it's been bad. But imagine having three or four years of no rain whatsoever. What would that do to an agriculture society? Kill it. Kill it. Destroy it. The society, the money, the resources, the food, the water, people are going to die left and right. But Elijah said, I'm hearing from God. This is what I'm going to pre present to the king, knowing that the king is going to hate me, the king is going to be after me, but I'm going to be obedient and be used by God, knowing that my nation that I love, people are going to die because of this bold stance. And I think that's what we need to do. You look at America right now. This is not a political thing whatsoever. But if you look at America right now, and you see the issues that's going on, you see that there are many Christians, Christ followers around, who's willing to take a stand, but they don't because they're afraid of what other people might think. Thank God Almighty Elijah did not. Thank God Almighty that Elijah stood up and said, you know what, I'm going to be hated. I'm going to be hated by the king. I'm going to be hated by others because their friends and family are going to die. But it doesn't matter because he was obedient to God's calling in his life. There's so much more that God wants to do in you because, check it out, there's so much more that he wants to do through you. But before God can do anything through you, he needs to do something what? In you. And that's what the three points that I have for today is this. God prepares us to do something great. There's three seasons that we see here of preparation in order for us to do these great things um, for God. And we're going to see these three ones. And the first one is this. If you want to write, write this down, is this. 
isolated pain. Isolated pain. Make sure you write that down. Isolated pain. And let's find out. We'll start in verse 2. So what just happened, we found out that Elijah went to King Ahab, and then King Ahab, basically, we didn't find out what he does until later on, but I would say that King Ahab was really ticked off. So then this is what happens in verse 2. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah and says, Leave here, turn eastward, and hide in the what? Kareth Ravine. Everybody needs to know this. Everybody say, Kareth Ravine. Everybody say, Kareth Ravine. Kareth Ravine. I want to get this into your mind because when we talk about the Kareth Ravine, you need to know that this was that that testing, that this was that place, and, and the Kareth Ravine is known as this place where it's isolated. And, and it's like almost a desert-like place. Uh, it, uh, according to what it actually means, the Hebrew means cut off and cut down. It's a place where nobody wants to go to. It's a place that there's no civilization. It's just a desolate place where there's nobody at all. Where trees are cut down. A desert-like place. And this is the place. It's kind of like you, you hear that if something goes wrong and with German, Germany, they're going to send you to where? They're going to send you to a country above China. Siberia, exactly. They're going to send you to Siberia because it's a desolate place. You don't want to go there. And nobody wants to go there. The Kareth Ravine is kind of like this. This place that you don't want to go to. This place that you are so isolated from culture, isolated from people, isolated from everything. It's, it's kind of like you go to prison and you go to solitary confinement for a long time. You don't want to go to solitary confinement. You don't want to be by yourself because just that interaction with other people, it's just uplifting, isn't it? And I think that there, we, maybe here, you're in that place where you're like, there's so much going on. I am in isolated pain. I am in a place where I'm so isolated. Nobody seems to care, which they do, by the way. But it feels like you're isolated from God. You're isolated from other people. You're isolated and you're like, I'm, I feel like I'm cut off from God. I'm cut off from other people. All this stuff is going on and I feel so secluded and isolated. And I'm here to tell you, if you're in that place, God is there in your Kreeth Ravine. God sent, before God could do something great through Elijah, God had to do something great, what? In Elijah. And this season of isolated pain is a must in our spiritual life. If everything's going great and dandy and awesome in our lives, we're not going to necessarily turn to God and tell Him thanks. But if we're in this isolated place in our life, the only place we can turn is, is to who? To God. So check this out. We're going to go right into this. This is a season of breaking. And, and before I go, I, I'm, I'm going to tell you personally is this. When I first started the church, um, about, what is it, about a year and a half ago, um, we got here about two years ago. On J July 29th, we, we arrived from Florida to here. Um, and I, it, back, back in my old church, we had about 1,200 people, a lot of people. I was the, 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 and you've heard this story, I was the youth pastor, the biggest youth group in the area and all this stuff. But God said, leave and go to Evansville, where the only people that we knew were my mother and father-in-law. That's the only people that we knew. And we're like, God, why on earth are you allowing us to leave our comfort zone, money, resources, and everything, to go to the Kreeth Ravine? Why did you allow us to go to this Kreeth Ravine where we knew nobody? And I can tell you the honest truth, for the first three to four months, and even probably, even to this day, it's felt so desolate, so cut off. It's because it's like, does anybody actually care? We're, we're preaching our heart out, and the band and Rachel, I mean, they're, they're singing their heart out. And are people really being changed? And sometimes I go home after the service, even to today, and especially back when we had five people. I'm like, God, why the crap did you allow us to go into this Kreeth Ravine? 
And I believe God had this message prepared in advance. Because check this out. Um, Thursday night was probably the greatest getting out of the Creeth Ravine um, of my life. I'm going to tell you, I'm, I'm just, I'm, you know me, I'm honest, aren't I? Uh, I am honest. For the last year and a half or two, I've felt like Rachel and I, we've had ups and downs, but we've been in this isolated pain, Creeth Ravine, because it doesn't seem like anybody cares about Jesus. It doesn't seem like people care. And yeah, people do a lot, but listen, it wasn't until Thursday night, men's Bible study right in this room here, that I poured my heart out to the guys about the building and everything like this, and every single one of them said, Dave, we've got your back. As long as you've prayed about it, as long as you seek God, we've got your back. I went home and I cried because just the knowledge that people actually do care about the mission and the vision of Catalyst Church makes the difference of getting out of the Creeth Ravine. Because I felt, and it's, it's perception, I felt all along that it's, it's Dave that's been carrying this. Knowing that it's God that's been carrying us. But to hear that the men, and, and then it's ironic because the ladies are going through a ladies Bible study um, through James. And they have these homework assignments. And the homework assi assignment this, this week was to text or call your pastor and say, great job, pastor. Um, and so here's the men um, doing their thing. And then all of a sudden, the lady stepped up and they're all texting me. I'm like, man, this is great. Wow, this feels great. So going through the isolated pain, there come seasons of being supportive of each other, which allows the desolate pain to go away. But before I, before Elijah, before us, can get out of the Creeth Ravine, desolate, depressing time, we need to understand that we had to go through it so God can use us to do something great. Does that make sense? All right. So this is what ends up happening. And it says this. It says, The word of the Lord came to Elijah. It said, Leave here and turn eastward and hide in the where? Everybody say, Creeth Ravine. Creeth Ravine. All right. East of the Jordan, you will drink from the brook that I have ordered the ra and I have ordered the ravens to feed you. So in this time, who's going to bring the food? The ravens. The bird's going to bring food and, and, and provide for him. And where is he going to drink from? The, the brook, the river, all right? And then it goes on. Um, and I'm going to write this next point down. The next point of, of, of our season of preparation is total dependence. Total, complete dependence on God. So the first part of your season in the Creeth Ravine is what? Isolated what? Isolated pain. Saying like, where are you God? This hurts, this hurts. And then the second part of the season of growing you into a great man or woman of God is this. A total dependence on Him. How many of you guys can honestly say, I, I, I don't understand it, but right now I'm completely and totally dependent on God. All right? If you're not, you're in the wrong place because we need to always be dependent on God. No matter how much we have, no matter how little we have, we need to depend, be dependent. And this is what happens in the Creeth Ravine. In verse 5 it says this, So he, Elijah, did what the Lord told him to do. Listen to God and what? Do what he says. That's what he did. He listened to God. He left culture. He left society. And he went to the Creeth Ravine. And this is what happens. He went to the Creeth Ravine, east of the Jordan, and stayed there. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning, and bread and, eat, uh, bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the where? Brook. He was dependent on God allowing this drought not to affect the brook. He was dependent on God to keep the water flowing. He was dependent on the God to bring the who? The birds, the ravens, to bring him bread and meat in the morning and in the what? Evening. evening. Did it say anything about needing to store up more food, knowing that God's not going to provide later on? It says this. He woke up in the morning. The birds brought him food. He had just enough to make it through. In the evening, when his stomach started to rumble again, the birds came and gave him the food that he needed to get through. And God's the same way. 
God's not going to give you a million dollars. All right? Whatever preacher says, hey, give to the church. Do what the church wants you to do. If you, if you give $350, we'll send you a cloth and wipe it on your head, smell it and sniff it, and you'll be good and God will bless you. That's not how God works. God, if he wants to, he can do whatever the crap he wants to do. If he wants to give you a million dollars, he's going to give you what? A million dollars. But God is going to take care of your daily needs. Your what needs? Daily needs. When, when Jesus was praying in, in the garden, it's like, Lord, give me my daily bread. My what bread? Now listen to this. So if you're freaking about tomorrow, what you're going to eat tomorrow, if you are a child of the living God, you're going to have food when? Tomorrow. Because you're dependent on Him. So why worry today about tomorrow? Because you need to concentrate on what you're eating today. And whatever that matter is, and, and yes, 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 that's food, but that's everything. Why do you worry about your job tomorrow if you need to do the best in your job today? Why are you worried tomorrow about your, how your kids are acting tomorrow if they're screwing up today? Figure out today, and God, in this season of the Kareth Ravine, don't worry about tomorrow. Now, I'm not saying just be a slacker and being like a hippie and say, whatever happens tomorrow. Yeah, there's planning that goes along, and God gives us the strength to be able to plan for tomorrow, but don't worry about tomorrow. Concentrate on today. Be the man and woman of God today. As Elisha was, because Elisha was totally dependent on the ravens for the provision. And just, and just play with that story a little bit. Imagine waking up in the morning, or you, you have this. Let's play with this story a little bit. Here's Elijah, sleepless night, um, and maybe the raccoons are bothering him or whatever. So he had a sleepless night. So he's waking up at about 9 o'clock, but he wakes up by the tapping on his head by these silly ravens. He wakes up and then, oh, the ravens are here. Oh, there's a, there's a steak and lobster and there, there's, yeah, there's meat and there's bread. So he wakes up and he, who's the only friend? He, he had God, yes, but who's the only friends? The ravens. And ravens are but ugly birds. They really are filthy, nasty birds. Think. God can use people in culture that are filthy and nasty, in culture's minds, to use to become your friends and provide for you. But many times in culture we say, ravens of this world, forget you, but maybe God's using the ravens to teach you a lesson. So all that to say is dependence on God is, is a must. Here's, here's kind of like a funny story that I found. There's a single widowed mother um, who, who, was a, who, who ha had a food pantry or went to the food pantry and, and this food pantry gave her just, just enough um, to make it through. So she went to this food pantry, she came back to her apartment and, and she started to eat all the food. And, and then and as soon as all the food was up, um, she started to, to shout out to God and said, God, where are you? Where have you been? I'm hungry. She verbally shouted out. Her atheist a neighbor that was next door um, came by and knocked on her door and said, you know what? Shut up, woman. There's no God. They're, they're, why are you shouting out? Go get a job. Go to another food pantry. Go figure it out. And she just said this. She said this. I don't have the transportation. I don't know where to go. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm desolate. I don't know what to do. So the atheist said, there is no God. There's nothing. You're stupid. You're stupid. You're stupid. Slammed the door shut and walked. That was during the evening. Next morning, uh, the, this widow, God-fearing woman, um, shouted out to God during her prayer time. Said, God, where are you? I don't have any food to eat. Literally, my cabinets are empty. My cabinets are barren. I don't have any food. And I don't have a place to go get food. I have nothing. I have nothing at all. The atheist came to the door and knocked on the door really hard and said, You know what? There is no God, you stupid woman. There is no God. And the lady said, yes, there is a God, and I can prove it to you. 
So she, she went back into her prayer time, and the atheist is really getting ticked off at this time. This is not an attack on atheists. This is a story illustration, so if you're an atheist, hear the story. So the atheist walks out and goes to the grocery store, gets a bunch of food, brings back to the woman, knocks on her door, and says this, here's food, shut up, and leave us alone. It was me that provided this food for you. And the, the, the woman opened up the door and fell to her knees and shouted out, said, thank you, God, so much providing you allowed the devil to pay for the food. <laughs> so think about that. It's, it's God can use miscellaneous things like that People who are unexpected to provide, but God is going to provide if you seek after Him and be dependent on Him and not about our food pantry. Be dependent on Him and not somebody else. Be dependent on Him and nobody else. You with me? Yeah. All right. Here we go. Point three is this. Unconditional obedience. What is, what is the first season? Isolated pain. Isolated pain. That was the second season. And then the third season is this, unconditional what? Obedience. Obedience. And this is a pretty doggone cool, unbelievable story. And again, just because it's in the Bible, don't try to psychoanalyze. Oh, that really didn't happen, or this really didn't happen. It really did happen, because it's in God's Word. It says this in verse 7. Sometime later, all right? So we don't know how long that is, but I, I'm thinking with the story at hand, I'm thinking this might have been six to eight months, maybe a year later on, of being in the Creeth what? I mean, so did the Creeth ravine last a little while or a long time? It lasted a while. It really, truly did. But this is what ha- ended up happening. In verse 7, Sometime later, the brook dried up. What was the brook? We got the water. The source of the water the source source of his dependence on god the brook dried up he had no water he had no way to drink he is going to die so he seeks after god and this is what he what it says um because there's no rain in the land common sense because there is a drought verse eight it says this the word of the lord came to him and says go once once to zaraph in zidon um, and stay there I have commanded a widow in that place to supply you with food. So what also disappeared? The ravens. Because not only did the ravens disappear, the brook disappeared. So here is, and think about this, just think about your life and my life. There are seasons where God's provision seems distant, but at the same time, we need to seek after God and say, okay, you provided birds, you provided the brook, and we're here, and, di- um, and, and, and I don't know what's next. So God says, yes, go, go. I've got something better for you. You've been through this season called the Creeth, what? The, in the Creeth Ravine, you've been through this season of desolation and isolation, and now I've got something next. I've got something next. This is the next Go, and I've commanded a widow to take, take you and, and give you food. So he went to Zerath. Um, where, when, when he came to the town gate, a widow was there gathering sticks. He called to her and asked, Would you bring me a little water in a jar so that I might drink? As she was going to get it. So in other words, what was she going to do? She was going to give this water. She was going to give water to a complete who? Stranger. All right? So he, she, as she was walking away, he says this. As she was walking away, he called her and said, And bring me, please, a piece of what? Bread. God, he, he was so confident that God had chosen that widow. Because God had already said, You know what? There's going to be a widow. There's going to be a person that's going to take care of your needs. The widow did not know, but it was being prompted to be at that specific place at that specific time so Elijah could interact with this widow. And that's how God works. I am not an advocate at all about coincidences. I'm not. There's no coincidence 
at all because God is sovereign and God allowed you to be here today. God allowed these circumstances to happen in this story. And God is going to allow His sovereign will to happen in your life so that you look at the story of your life and you could probably see God working through other people's lives. In this case, it's the widow. And this is what the widow says. As surely as the Lord your God lives, she replies, I do not have any bread. Only a handful of flour in a jar and a little bit of oil in a jug. I am gathering a few sticks to take home and to make a meal for myself and my son that we may eat it and die. So not only did God choose a widow who didn't have any income coming in, God chose a widow who was going to provide for her son their last, what, meal. So God might be using you. You might not have a lot of resources. You might not have a lot of money. You might not have a lot of um, education. But God's going to use you and your last pennies. God's going to use you and your last bit of energy. God's going to use you and everything you have at the end of your Kreeth Ravine. Check this out. Was the widow in her Kreeth Ravine? The widow was in her Kreeth Ravine. Elijah is coming out of her Kreeth Ravine, entering into the woman's Kreeth Ravine, and because of coming together, you're going to see a miracle happen here. Elijah said to her, what? Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Go home and do what I have said. But first, but what? But first, make a small cake for me and, and from what you, what you have and bring it to me. And then make some for yourself and your son. I don't know about you. If I was a widow, I'd be like, okay, I know you're a man. I'm a woman. Women, we cook. Don't you understand that I'm about to make bread for me and my son that's just enough for us? So, Elijah, man, can you imagine? There's not going to be any food left. There's not going to be anything left. But this is what the widow actually does. She what? She what? Next word. She went. She's like, all right, all right. I'll, I'll do what you, you want me to do. Because what did, back, back in verse like 8, it says, God commanded the widow. So let me pause and say this. God's sovereign will over your life trumps anything you want to do. Period. The end. God, you might want to do this, but God wants you to do this. You're going to do this because God wants you to do what? That. All right? So I want to challenge you with this. Stop fighting God. Just listen to God and what? Do what He says. And by doing that, things are going to work out better than fighting with God. So she went away and did what Elijah told her to do. So, she, um, so there was food every day um, for Elijah and the woman. Um, and her family. The jar of flour did not use up, and the jug of oil did not run dry. It keep um, in keeping with the word of the Lord spoken by Elijah. Imagine that just that's just sort of freaky stuff. How God works. You got two jars here, one filled with flour and one filled with what? Oil. So they're taking out, they're doing their oil, they're doing their flour, however you ladies cook. So they're, they're cooking this bread and their supplies. And then they're like, all right, that's all the oil that we have. They put it up on the shelf. All right, that's all the flour that we have for today. That evening, they're ready to cook some more. They go back to the same jar. And what's in the jar? Wow. Oil and flour. How? How? God. God. We don't know how. But we knew that God used ravens. And we know that God used these oil uh, jars to provide. All right, here we go. So you got it so far? It's a pretty cool story. It gets a little bit better. Verse 17. Sometime later, the son and the woman, the son 
um, of the woman who owned the house became ill. He grew worse and worse and finally stopped breathing. She said to Elijah, and don't we do this to God? We blame God for everything. What do you have against me, man of God? We sometimes say, God, why are you doing this? My, my family is sick. This is sick. My, my finances are in, 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 the, in the gutter. Why are you allowing this to do this? Again, Kreeth Ravine. Oh, Lord, my God. Uh, where are we at? Okay. What, what have you done this to me, man of God? Did you come to, to put in my mind um, the sin and to kill my son? Verse 19. Give me your son, Elijah replied. You took him from, and took him from his arms, carried him into the upper room where he was staying, and laid him on his bed. Then he cried out to God and said, O oh Lord, my God, have you brought, brought tragedy against me and this woman that I'm staying with by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself out on the boy three times and cried to the Lord, O oh Lord, my God, let this boy live and return to me. The Lord heard Elijah's cries. And the boy's life returned to him, and he lived. Elijah picked up the boy and carried him down um, from the room um, into the house. He gave him to his mother and said, Look, your son is alive. At that moment, transformation happened in the woman's life. Because this, the woman said to Elijah, Now I know. Not when the jars, not when the circumstances happened, but now I know that a miracle has happened. I know you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord from your mouth is truth. And it's, it's the last illustration to wrap this all up. With this unconditional obedience. It's kind of like the Karate Kid. You remember, have you ever seen Karate Kid? I'd love it. Because the Karate Kid is as stubborn as I am. Because, as you know, Mr. Miyagi, he, he had the whole mindset of training. Seasons of preparation. And he did this. He's like, all right, so here's this little kid. Come, what's the kid's name? Daniel-san. Daniel son. There you go, daniel son. So daniel son comes up, and he's like, teach me to do karate. Okay, Howard, first off, you need to what? Paint the fence. All right, so paint the fence, paint the fence, paint the fence, and or whatever he did, like paint the fence. All right? And then Mr. Miyagi, the, what, what did Daniel do? Daniel painted like me. He's like, like this. And he's like, no, paint the fence. Like, like well, however, all right? And then he, he had to do wa- wax his car, right? So he did this and everything. And Daniel-san afterwards basically came up to Mr. Miyagi and said, Why are you making me do this? I've painted this entire fence. I, I've, I've waxed all these cars in the area. Why are you making me do this? And of course, you know the story. Mr. Miyagi comes and said, Let's fight. And let, no, paint the fence. He blocks all the shots and all the stuff. And I'm here to tell you, it's kind of like the karate kid in this story and in your life. You're in the Kreeth Ravine painting the fence. You don't understand why you're painting the fence. You don't understand why you're in this season right now. But it's a season of preparing you for something. You don't know why you're waxing the cars. You don't know why it's over and over and over again in this Kreeth Ravine. But God is preparing you for something. And maybe today he wants to get you out of it. But he knows that you're so stubborn that he's going to keep you in it. Because he's teaching you and teaching you and teaching you some more. So the question is, Catalyst Church, are you going to be in this? uh, Are you okay to be in this Kreeth Ravine? Because in this Kreeth Ravine, no matter what you're going through right now, in this Kreeth Ravine, there's a season of preparation So God can do something great in you first so that he can prepare to do something through you so that you can do some amazing things for the kingdom of God. Go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes if you don't mind. Um, uh, Go ahead and come. All right, go ahead and come share real quick. 
come up and share. Going to listen to this testimony real quick. I, I, uh, it's the first time that I was talking here, but I feel in my heart very strong that I need to make a testimony about this because it was extremely real. That's happened when I was young. I come in for a poor parents and we don't have any money for college and one year when I've been in college, uh, I lost my grant because I have been problem with my scores. I remember that my father, my father is a very awesome person but he's very limiting, you know. And he said to me, Breezy, you cannot go into college because we don't have money. In that moment, I was a little stubborn. I said, no, I will go in, I will try it. The only way that I left the college is or graduated or dead. Well, I been, I made my paperwork, but really I don't have any, any, any penny. Well, I mean, I said, I don't know what I said that to my parents. Really, I can. And sit in a corner and start crying. You know, crying, not like loud, but crying. And I really was, I, I follow, I, I grew up in a Christian family, but you know, that was the first big miracle that God gave to provide me. I was crying. And then one man named Felo Caravaggio saw me in that corner. And he said to me, what's happened? Uh, what happened, girl? I said, I need to go in college, but I don't have any money. Now, now I place all the paperwork, but I don't have any penny for pay, and my parents cannot have any money. That person I never saw in whole my life. Well, he said to me, I would pay you. I was scared. He went to the cashier and gave the money. I said, oh my gosh. That was the first time I said, God provide. After that, I was scared because I believe maybe this guy having anything else. So one time I went to this office and said, why you help me? He said to me, I saw you crying there, looking for going to college. And I have a son in drugs that don't, you know, want to go in college. So I saw you crying because you want to study. And he was not Christian guy. He's not Christian guy. He, I, I don't know where he is now, but, you know, somebody that was in, in, never met him, that was not Christian, provided the money. And then after that, never, 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 God uh, left me alone. Always the money, provide for it. One time I don't having anything for it. And he provided me, a person that come and offer me a job, a job for $2 per hour with the condition that he will, you know, with the, the idea that it's, it's low, but I can give you the, the breakfast, the lunch and dinner. So that is real, you know. God is the same past and now and the future. And that's it's the first time that I talk here, but believe it, God provide. I never, I am totally dependent on God. And God bless me a lot, but I don't worry about the future because after this, I'd be totally sure that He is a living God. Awesome. All right, let's give our hand. Thank you, Gracie. A real, a real story. As you notice, what she said is God does not change. He's the same today, um, yesterday, and forever. So. Right now, I just want you to just think in your mind. Well, no matter where you're at, you might have those stories like Breezy has, but maybe you don't because you're still in that Kreeth ravine. 
And I want to encourage you with this. You're going to be in that Kreeth ravine and you're going to feel isolated and you're going to have this pain of isolation unless you have Jesus. The loving Father, God, He wants to take care of His children and He wants to take care of you as His children. But if first things first, you need to be and have a relationship with Jesus Christ. So that's the question right now. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? Think of that. Do you have a relationship with Jesus? If you do, you might be in that Kreeth ravine. You might not have any money to, to give, kind of like Breezy. Nothing. I don't, I, she didn't know how she was going to pay for college. Now she's a successful business lady because of somebody stepping up, a non-Christian person. But it's because she did have a relationship with Christ that God took care of her today, yesterday, and will take care of her forever in eternity. So simply, do you have a relationship with Christ? If not, understand this. You are a sinner. Jesus Christ came to this earth and loves you enough that he died on the cross for you to wipe away your sins, to have that relationship with you. So I'm going to lead you through a prayer. If you say, you know, I I want this relationship with Christ, not for just being taken care of, that's part of it, but just so that you can have a relationship with him and have someone while you're in that Kreeth ravine, more than the ravens, more than the water, you have God on your side. So with nobody looking around, if you, if you want to pray that prayer, just say a prayer to, to God. Say, dear Jesus, I'm a sinner. Forgive me for sinning. I believe and have faith that you came, you died, and you rose again. And help me through my grief through me. With nobody looking around, if you pray that prayer and you really meant it, just, I mean, you really meant it, go and just raise your hand right where you're at. Fantastic. Anybody else? Great. Anybody else? Great. Go ahead and put your hand down. That's fantastic. <laughs> if you pray that prayer, I want you to just go ahead. Nobody's looking. Just look at me for a second. That's fantastic. Because listen, if you prayed that prayer and I can see you, But most importantly, God can see you and you are in this place, this amazing place where you are now completely relying on him because he is your spiritual father. He came, he died for you and he loves you so very much. And don't be mistaken that he does and he always will. No matter if you screw up tomorrow, screw up today, he always loves you. And now you have a relationship with him. So I want to encourage you, if if you pray that prayer, Fill out this long card. Fill it out with, I'm beginning a relationship with Christ. Drop it in one of the mailboxes. And we want to follow up with you and help you through this Kreeth Ravine together. So congratulations. Really, congratulations. Catalyst Church, look at me. One of the toughest things as a pastor of this type of church is that there are so many people in here that have burdens. We're not a rich church, but we are a loving church that loves people. So listen to me. If you're in the Kreef Ravine right now, I want you to stand up. If you're in the Kreef Ravine, stand up. I love you guys. I really do. Some of you guys I know Some of you guys I don't know. But this I know. God loves you. And it's exciting for me to see you guys standing because this. You are in isolated pain right now. But my question is, are you dependent on God? Or are you dependent on this church? Are you dependent on others? Or are you dependent on God? Are you dependent on your job or your family? Or are you dependent on God? I'm here to tell you the truth. If you are dependent, if you're standing up or if you're sitting down, if you're dependent on anything else other than God, you are going to stay in that Kreeth ravine. That's why we harp on reading your Bible and praying because that's that relationship with God. So I love you guys. I care for you guys. And this is what we're going to do. 
if you're around the people that are standing up, I just want you to stand and just put your hand on them. And we're going to pray for these people. So just, if you want to just stand up and just put your hand on, on one of them, we're going to pray for them. Just find somebody, we're going to pray for them. Because check this out. In the Creeth Ravine, Elijah only had the birds. But he had God. So let us be the birds of prayer in these people's lives right now. I'm going to go ahead and pray, but if you would pray with me over these people. Because guys, listen, we need to be there in the Creeth Ravine in these tough times for people not just today but tomorrow not just tomorrow but for eternity's sake whether you know them or not so let's pray heavenly father those who are standing and those who are maybe sitting down and they're in the creeth ravine right now it's a place that they feel cut off they feel they're abandoned but lord i pray with the the hands on their shoulders, on their arms, the hugs, the holding of hands, however they're being touched by us as humans. May you touch them in their heart and in their mind. And may their soul know that no matter if they're going through this tough Kreeth Ravine time, that you are there. When no other human being might be there, you are there. They're in isolated pain. They're in total dependence now on you for the next step in this season of preparation, God, is this complete and utter obedience. And maybe that's why they're still there in the Kreeth Ravine, because they're not being obedient. Lord, you know the circumstances. You know the situations. You know that what needs to be resolved in their lives. I pray that you'll give them the strength, the provisions, whether it's health, financially, or just psychologically, whatever the case might be, may you allow them to get out of this Kreeth Ravine. And may we as the church be there for them. And may they not feel that they are by themselves, but they've got a church body that loves them very much. I pray all this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. So as we sing this last song, let's all stand and let's sing it with our whole mind and our whole heart, and give our last bit of energy and praise to God. And know this, that the God who loves us is there with us forever. So let's go ahead and sing this last song.